So in the final part of this, uh, this session, I want to move on to comparing connect times. Uh, in other words, connect time statistics. And so the idea here is, is that you may have mapped connect times in a group of healthy controls. Uh, you may have also done the same thing for a patient group or a treatment group. And the aim then is, is to identify connect time attributes that differ between the control group and the, and the patient group or that are associated with a certain behavior or are modulated by treatment. An alternative goal might be connect time based prediction. And this is where we wanna actually use connect time attributes to predict something about the future that might be clinical outcome or response to the treatment. So I'm gonna consider both connect time inference as well as connect time prediction. In both these cases, the challenge is the high dimensionality of the connect time. We're typically dealing with hundreds of nodes and potentially thousands, tens of thousands of distinct connections. So what are the different, what are the different attributes that we can compare between connect times? The simplest is we can do a global comparison. So each individual is characterized by one value, one summary value that characterizes their connect time. This can be something in summary values such as efficiency, modularity, rich clock coefficient. The disadvantage of this is that it doesn't give us much localizing power. If we find a difference in something like efficiency, it doesn't tell us what region, it doesn't tell us what particular connection is associated with that difference. We then move to node level comparison, which gives us a little more localizing specificity. This is where we test hypotheses about particular nodes. This could be node strength, node efficiency, node clustering. We can then take one step further and move to connection level comparison. This is the most common approach in, in chronic times. This is where we're making inference about connectivity strength, whether that be the streamline count or functional connectivity. And this is what I'm gonna focus on in the remaining part of this uh, presentation. What we would wanna do here, if we're specifically looking at connect time inference, we can go down the path of connect, a connection, connect time wide association study at CWAS. This involves testing uh, our model. Uh, so this could be a T-test, F-test, whatever the particular model is, independently at every connection in our connect time. And so every connection is endowed with a T-statistic and an uncorrect P-value. The challenge then is, is dealing with the massive multiple comparison problem across the family of edges. So how would we do that? There's generic methods to do that. So one school of thought is, well, we, we don't need to correct for multiple comparisons. I, I don't think that's a, that's a good idea. It risks um, the, the, the problem of false positives. Another approach is Bonferroni. In general, it's too stringent unless we have really large sample sizes. A good approach is the false discovery rate. This, is, this can be computed efficient, efficiently. It just requires us to order p-values and apply this threshold. And I'm sure many of you have come across um, the FDR already. However, these generic methods don't take into account connect time specific attributes. We know that in connect times, effects of interest are more likely to be confined within subnetworks, interconnected subnetworks, as I've shown here in the example of scenario two where we see that the red connections are the effect of interest and they are clustered in a, in a network. And so there's a lot of evidence of this in pathology. I've shown some references there on, on the right hand side. We also see this in terms of behavior and, and, and cognition that the effects of interest are clustered within networks. So scenario two is more likely relative to scenario one where the effects of interest are randomly or sporadically distributed across the network. Now, from the perspective of FDR and Bonferroni, both scenario one and scenario two are equivalent. There's no difference for them. But there have been methods that have been developed that leverage this connect time specific attributes, this subnetwork sub like behavior to improve statistical power. One of those approaches is the network based statistics, the NDS. And this involves the same process of testing our, our model our statistical hypothesis at every edge. And then we threshold those edges. So we only keep the edges that are above a minimum effect size. And then in, in those thresholded set of edges, we aim to identify subnetworks. And so in this example here, I've shown a subnetwork that was found and it comprises five connections. And then we can do permutation testing to ascribe a p-value to that subnetwork 
which tells us what's the likelihood of finding a subnetwork of size five just as a matter of chance, in other words, under the null hypothesis. So just to recap that, the idea is we once again, we, we, test, uh, we uh, test our hypothesis at every edge, which is done independently in, in the sense of mass numeric testing. We apply a threshold to identify the edges with a minimum effect size. And then among those edges, we seek to identify connected components. And in this example, we find a component with F plus size five. Um, and then permutation testing, as I've shown here, can be used to ascribe a p-value to that component. This involves shuffling uh, patients and controls and then repeating this procedure again and again and again to build up an empirical null distribution. So here's an example of an empirical null on the right. And we can use that to uh, find a, uh, a to estimate a p-value. There are a range of other methods for performing CWAS. I've, I've listed some of these here. This is certainly not an exhaustive list and I'm not gonna have time to go through each of these. Um, these generally vary in at what scale the null hypothesis can be rejected. So are we, are we performing inference at the level of connections, subnetworks, or the whole network? And some of these methods also start to move into uh, the area of machine learning and prediction, particularly the regression. So there's a bit of a gray area here between inference and, uh, and prediction. I wanna now move on to, to actually move on to prediction and using the connect time to predict, uh, for example, outcomes, individual outcomes, treatment response and diagnostic status. And this involves cross validation using test and training sets. So what we can do is we've mapped our connect time for each individual. We can take the upper triangle, remember these matrices are symmetrical, even the lower triangle. We can vectorize that and come up with a, a, a feature matrix where we've got subjects by features and then divide that matrix up into a test and a training set. And once we have that format, we can use generic supervised learning methods to uh, train a model to predict our, our desired outcome. And so Beatty and colleagues have used this and evaluated predicting binary outcomes in, in various data sets. So the, uh, the horizontal axis here represents the improvement in the AUC. So the more to the right we go, the more improvement we have in AUC. And what we see here is that uh, most linear methods perform quite well. So whether we're using support vector classification, ridge regression or logistic regression, we get more or less the same performance as long as we impose um, L2 regularization when we're training the model. Uh, related approach is referred to as connection based predictive model. And this is where we use a very simple model. We just got, a, it's effectively a correlation that we, that we use and we, we pick out features to, um, that uh, yield a, a, a strong correlation in terms of cross validation. I won't go into the detail of that here. Just to wrap up, to give some tips when we're using, when we're performing connectome based prediction, uh, if you're using functional connectivity matrices, as has been shown by Varakwai, uh, it's useful to map the correlation or the covariance to a tangent space. This provides, a, I guess you could think of it as a, as a more natural home for uh, covariance, and this can improve prediction accuracies, as I've shown here, although the improvement is, 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 is relatively small. It's also important to remember that error bars on accuracy estimates can be large, particularly for small sample size. And this is an argument, if we're going down the path of connect time prediction, large sample sizes are important. Here are some more general tips for, for prediction. So in particular, K-fold should be used over bleed one out, area under a curve is a good measure for accuracy and evaluation. Be cautious of data leakage between test and training sets. And if possible, it, it's good to evaluate your train classifier across different sites. And this allows us to, to uh, investigate how well the classifier, how well the model generalizes across scanner sites. So to wrap up, here's some software that, uh, that you might wanna consider using if you're performing connect time statistics. Um, the BCT is perhaps the most relevant. There's both a MATLAB and a, and a Python version of the BCT, and I've provided, provided the websites uh, for both those versions. And once again, this is not an exhaustive list of software for performing statistics. Uh, so finally, I just wanted to draw your attention to the Australian School on Clinics. 
working at a school that uh, is reducing the fundamentals of connectomics, not only statistics, but also mapping and connectome analysis. We're running our next school in Melbourne in, in 2021, so keep uh, your eyes open for the advertising if you're interested in uh, sort of joining. Uh, further reading on the topics here, take a look at chapters 10 and 11 in our book. This is with, uh, with Alex Bernardo and Ed Bullmore. And finally, as I've already mentioned, the slides, uh, all the slides that I've presented here are available for download from the website that I've uh, shown you at the bottom of the slide. So thank you very much, and I hope you uh, enjoy the, uh, the rest of the, uh, the workshop. Uh, thank you.